we started a new series last week, and uh, we're talking about the power to change. At the beginning of the year, everybody likes to talk about change. They like to make changes. They like to set New Year's resolutions. Well, we want to talk about the power to change permanently and the power for positive, permanent change, okay? Now, this does not come... Uh, from any other source than that which we're going to talk about today. The title of my message today is The Power is in You. Now, before you think I'm going all motivational speaker on you and trying to sell you something, this is not that. That's not what I'm talking about today. Now, do I believe in positive thinking and being confident and hard work? Yes, I do. Um, but that's not what this is. And this, that is not the key to success. Listen, that some people think it is. Now, are those things good and important? Sure. But that's not the key to what we're going to talk about today. The power is in you. Um, faith always trumps positive thinking. Confidence comes from a relationship with the risen, victorious Christ. Not just from somebody patting you on the back or you getting a trophy or somebody giving you an award or telling you that you look nice. Those are good things. But the fact is, your um, confidence comes from your relationship with the risen Christ. Um, now, my confidence comes from that, not in my fallen, not my confidence in my fallen nature, myself, or the limited knowledge and power that I possess. Now, is hard work important? Yes, the Bible says that it is. The Bible says if you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Laziness is a sin. Giving less than your best is a sin. But my hard work can never lead to the kind of fulfilling Christian life that Jesus planned for me. Now, I want you to let that sink in for a moment. It's not about my hard work. Should you work hard? Should you be determined? Yes. But that's not where success lies. Once again, just using Galatians 5, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It also talks about the works of the flesh. And so in Galatians 5, it talks about when you start doing things in your own effort, that it doesn't ever lead to good things, but it leads to bad things. The Bible calls that the works of the flesh. In other words, that's what your um, own effort produces. But, it says, the fruit of the Spirit. Now, how many of you have the power within you to grow fruit? I'm not talking about planting it. I'm not talking about watering it. I'm not talking about uh, putting it in good soil. But you have the power within you to grow it, to actually grow it. Well, no one has. You know why? Only God has that. Only God can produce real fruit in your life. Now, so once again, it's not our hard work but the work of Jesus that matters. We live in a culture that promotes confidence in self more than any time in history. And I find it very ironic that in this culture that promotes this so much, there are so many people that are not very confident. It's funny. What has this led to? Well, it's led to the greatest mental health crisis in world history, especially among young people. Um... I believe that the participation trophy culture has kind of led to some of this. I don't know if you ever look at uh, YouTube or whatever, but I see videos of young people, and they are losing their mind over the fact that they have to work 40 hours a week. <laughs> and I know those of us who are a little older laugh at that, and we're like, you know, yeah, well, welcome to the real world. But these are young people that are seriously facing a crisis. Why? Because they've been taught to just that self-confidence comes. You just offer it freely. Everybody gets it. Uh, you get a participation trophy. And when that happens, when you graduate college or you graduate high school, you think that you need the president's parking space, that you start out with the same salary as the CEO of the company. And, uh, you know, it just is not based in reality. As a result, they've lost the ability to cope. And they've lost the ability uh, to deal with work and life and crisis. But there is an answer. Let's not 
let's not lie to ourselves. You know, we, it's easy to, to mock, and I love Gen Z. I love our young people. I love teenagers. I love people in their 20s. Um, and I, I know that many of them have very difficult uh, times, uh, and, and I get that, okay? But the answer is not in a government program. The answer is found in Jesus Christ and what we're going to talk about today. Here's the deal. The greatest power in the universe is in you. Now, I'm not talking about, once again, self-confidence or talent or ability. We're talking about the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. The spirit that has power over death. The same spirit that God used when he spoke and the worlds exploded into existence. The universe, the stars, the planets. Do you know how many galaxies there are? Do you know how many stars there are? It's mind-boggling when you start. My oldest daughter, Brittany, is, she's really into astronomy. That is the right one, right? Astronomy is the science about, right? Astrology, right, is the one with all the zodiac signs and stuff. Okay, she's not into that, but she's into astronomy, okay? And, uh, you know, when you start studying about how vast the universe is, it's amazing, okay? But the power that is in you, listen closely, is greater than the power that's in this universe. You say, what is it? Well, let's read about it. First Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. Last week, we read First Peter 1, verses 1 through 4. And, of course, Peter was one of Jesus' disciples. He became the apostle known as Peter. Uh, His name means rock, okay? Um, He was a royal mess-up early in his uh, career, if you will. When he was following Jesus, he was one of these people that was always, he would jump in before he would think. He'd take action before he thought it all out. He'd say things that made it seem like he stuck his foot in his mouth, right? Right? And I, and I love this guy because he was all about action. But Peter denied Jesus. If you remember the story, he denied, he said to all the disciples, you might deny Jesus, but not me. And of course, he denied Jesus three times. Not only that, but he cursed God. And then he left. He quit. It's like he quit church. It's like he quit on his faith and he left it all. Here's what he said to the 12 that were the, the, actually to the 11 that were closest to Jesus, he said, I'm going fishing. I'm quitting this mess. I'm throwing in the towel. I don't know about you boys, but I'm out of here. That's what he said. So we're going to read what this guy discovered that changed his life. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 5. For this reason, whenever you read the Bible, you need to really read it and understand what it's saying. For what reason? He's talking about a reason. Well, we we talked about that last week. We learned last week that the goal is to get to know Jesus for this reason, getting to know him intimately, not just facts about him, but actually knowing him, and that can make permanent positive change through the promises of God. So for this reason, make every effort... Now, it's funny that I would read that because I just said effort is not the key. But everybody say effort. Ready? Effort. Say it, say it like you mean it. Effort. Make every effort to, and notice what he, he goes through this list. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a list person. I like writing things down and checking it off. Somehow or another, it makes me feel good. Uh, even if it's, do you do this? Sometimes I do something, I forgot to put it on the list, and I'll go write it on the list and check it off just so I can say that I checked it off. You ever do that? Okay. Well, he goes to this list. He says, there are things you need to do. Now, I'm going to explain this because Christianity is not a list, okay? But I'm going to explain what it means. He said, make every effort to add virtue to your faith. And to your virtue knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control, and to your self-control, patient endurance. Oh my, I wish you hadn't put that one in there. Anybody else pray this prayer? God, give me patience, but give it to me right now. 
patient endurance. And to your patient endurance, godliness. And to your godliness, brotherly kindness. And to your brotherly kindness, love. That's kind of a big list. And then here's what he says. For if these things reside in you and abound, reside in you. They live there. You, that, you, that is your address. That's where they are. And until you begin to understand that that's what Christianity really is, it's not about your performance, but it's about who resides in you, who is with you, who will never leave you or forsake you. When you forget that, you're going to get discouraged. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to quit. Man, we've got an epidemic of people that are Christians. And I really do believe they know Jesus. I really do believe they're saved. But they quit. You stop. Stop coming to church. Stop serving the Lord. Stop giving. I mean, we could just go on. But he says, if these things reside in you and abound, they live there. They're, they're abounding in you, he said, they ensure that you will neither be useless nor unfruitful. Now, I don't know about you, but I sure would like some of that. Anybody want to be useless? Nobody. We like to be useful. We like to feel needed. We like to feel like that we matter. He said, if these things reside in you and abound, they will ensure that you will neither be useless nor unfruitful. What you do will matter. You're going to produce fruit. You know, if for no other reason. I mean, we, want, we do this for the Lord, but let, let's be honest. Sometimes we think about, and we should think about, the legacy that we're leaving for our family, for our children. What are you leaving behind for them? Or are you leaving behind the legacy of, you know, get all you can, can all you get, and that's all you're going to do? Now, there are many good moral people that do that. Listen closely. Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, good to see Noah back here with us today. Let's give Noah a hand. Uh, so many of us prayed for him. But as it was in the days of Noah, the, the guy that rode the ark, not him, all right? So, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of, son of, the, of the Son of Man. Here's what he said. Listen. Listen to this awful list. These awful sins that they did. I mean, they were wicked, right? God destroyed the whole earth because of what they did. Listen to the bad things they did. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of Son of Man. For they were eating. Oh, how wicked. We're getting ready to go eat some in a minute. They were drinking. That doesn't mean they were getting drunk, but they were just existing, okay? They were eating and drinking. In other words, they, they had meals together. They were eating and drinking. And then listen to what else they did. Wicked. They were marrying. Oh, my goodness. Guess who designed and ordained marriage? It was God. Not only that, they were giving their children away in marriage. I mean, what? that is the most awful list of evil I've ever heard in my life. Well, of course not. They were living life. Is there anything wrong with eating and drinking? No. Got to do that and live. Anything wrong with marrying and giving in marriage? No, you got to have that so that the human race can continue. What was their problem? It's not what they did, it's what they didn't do. They left God completely out of the equation. And so there are a lot of us that will think, hey, you know what I need to do is I got to focus on my legacy. I got to leave behind something for my kids. And that's good. There's certainly nothing wrong with that. You should think about that. But that's not what he's talking about here. The fact is, if we're not careful, we will forget that it's very easy for us just to do what they did in the days of Noah. We're busy with life, not necessarily doing bad things. I mean, it's not like you're going and robbing a bank every day. It's not like you're murdering your neighbor. I mean, you know, you're, you're living a moral life. But it's very easy, listen, to leave God out of it. I heard one preacher say it this way, that there are people that are Christian atheists. He said, well, that's an oxymoron. What in the world does that mean? Well, it's a person that believes in God. They just act like he doesn't exist. 
And how many of us have been guilty of living that way? Well, here's what he said. He said, you will be neither useless or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but the one who lacks these things is blind and short-sighted. Man, blind, can't see. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what is going on around you. And then short-sighted, that may even be worse. And he's not talking about being nearsighted. What he's talking about in being short-sighted is that he doesn't think about eternity. He doesn't think about what matters most. Let's be honest. I've I've read recently that uh, in this generation, the young people that are born, you know, since 2010, that there will be something like 6 million of them that live to at least 100 years old. Isn't that incredible? Getting older and older and living longer and longer. Man, if I keep on getting worse and worse, I don't want to live 100 years, <laughs> you know? Somebody asked me that one time. You want to live 100 years? I said, not if it keeps on going like it is right now. But the, the point is this. You can be short-sighted because even if you live 100 years, guess what? It's a drop in the bucket. It's a drop in the ocean compared to eternity. Don't be short-sighted. He said because he's forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Don't forget your relationship with Jesus. Don't forget what is most important in life. Don't forget that you must prioritize certain things, even in a culture that does not. And then he says, therefore, brothers, diligently make your calling and election sure. He's talking about your salvation, your relationship with God. Be diligent about it. Make sure that you've got it, he says. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly provided for you. Well, the Apostle Peter is talking about making positive and permanent change in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he's he's saying that uh, this kind of life is impossible through his own effort, through your own effort, through my own effort. Peter tried this and failed. We read the story. Uh, And I want to ask you this question. If Peter, who literally walked on the earth next to Jesus, the creator, the son of God, I mean, literally, he ate with him, he talked with him, he lived with him for three and a half years. It's said of uh, young Jewish men that found a rabbi, that they would literally go with them everywhere they went. Even when they went to the bathroom, they'd follow them. They didn't go in the toilet with them, but they just kind of waited on them, right? Now, think about that. If Peter did, he was that close to Jesus, and he failed, well, what shot do you and I have? I mean, if he who saw the Son of God, if he messed up, well, what chance do I have? Well, the point is, he learned something. He learned that it was not his effort, but he learned two things. Number one, he learned to get to know Jesus better. We talked about that last week. And number two, that he had to depend on the Holy Spirit. That's why the title of my message is The Power Is In You. We'll explain that in just a minute. When Peter got saved, he had the Holy Spirit in him, okay? Technically, the Holy Spirit came on later. But when you and I get saved, we get the Holy Spirit in us. Okay, he lives in us, he dwells in us. And as a result of that, we have the power within us. That's what I'm talking about. Listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that you are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? You put your faith in Jesus, you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you declare that you're trusting him for salvation. You know what God says? The Holy Spirit lives in you. Isn't that good? I mean, you've got not only access to talk to God, but you've got God within you. At all times. And then Romans 8 9. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. So he's saying the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you've got that power, you've got access to it. That's the same power that brought the stars into existence, the universe, the galaxies, the earth, uh, photosynthesis, the eye, the human eye. Have you ever just thought about how amazing the human eye is? The ability to hear to touch and smell and see, I mean, incredible, incredible. He says that that power is in you. The power that brought Jesus back to life again is in you. He can resurrect a dead career. He can resurrect 
a, a dead family life. He can resurrect a dead spiritual life. He has the power to raise dead things to life. That's why Jesus came. Not so you and I could be moral. Not so you and I could, uh, you know, turn over a new leaf. Some people think that uh, moral deism is, the, is what we're after. And that, that is just a fancy way of saying that we believe in God and we believe that God sent Jesus simply to make us good. Now, should you be good? Yeah. Should you be a good citizen? Yes. Should you uh, live a moral life? Yes. That's not why he came. He came to bring dead things to life. And then Ecclesiastes, uh, I'm sorry, Ephesians 2.22, God is building a home. Did you know the Bible is clear that the Holy Spirit dwells in a believer? That's his home. But he also dwells in a church, a gathering. That's what the word church means. The word church doesn't mean a church building. The word church is about people. Uh, it literally means the gathering. So God is building a home, and he's using all of us, all of us, the good and the bad, those who have money and those who don't, those who are talented and those who are not, those who are brilliant and those who they scrape by. I almost said those are Alabama fans, but we know that there are some that are intelligent. But my point is this, that you and I need to understand that he's using all of us, and he's using you. He's using you to build home irrespective of how we got here. Aren't you glad that it doesn't matter what your past is? Aren't you glad that it doesn't matter that maybe you failed before? Peter failed. But God is building a home. He's using all of us irrespective of how we got here and what he is building. What is God building? He's building a church. He's building you. He's building people, and he wants you to be a part of it. So he's saying this, that this power is in you. He's not saying the power is from you. That's important. He's not saying the power is from you. He's saying the power is in you, and that is the Holy Spirit. Let me just give you a couple of reasons why we believe that the power is in you, and that you can make the kind of change that God wants you to make. Number one, the Spirit gives you the power to change. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to change. You might think that you don't have the power to change, but you do. You ever said something like this? Well, I just can't do that. That's just the way I am. Or I don't ever have patience for that. You might be impatient by nature, but the power is in you to make the change that God needs to make in your life. He said... For this reason, make every effort. Now, it seems like that I'm contradicting myself because I said that it's not your effort that matters. Uh, he's not saying that your effort doesn't matter at all. He's saying it's not what matters most. So what being able to be empowered by the Spirit of God entails uh, is the idea, the understanding that you're becoming aware that the Holy Spirit lives in you, and the more you're aware of that, you're making a decision, a conscious decision to say, yes, I'm going to follow the Spirit of God. You see, that's the same idea as repentance. You remember that Jesus said, repent, or you won't see the kingdom of heaven? The word repent means to change your mind. That's all it means. It's a beautiful word. It's probably one of the greatest words in the New Testament. Being able to repent means that you begin to agree with God. You begin to think like God thinks. And when I think like God thinks, everything changes. Um, and so he's saying that there is no change possible in my life unless I change my thinking. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not copy the behavior and the customs of this world. What are the customs of this world? Well, it's all on you. You get to heaven by being good. You get to heaven by your own effort. You have a relationship with God based on how good you are. I mean, that's how people think, right? But he's saying that unless you change the way you think, then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So... The power is in you. The Holy Spirit gives you the power to change. Number two, 
the Spirit gives you the process to change. You can tell I'm a preacher. I was starting those same words with the same letter, P. The power of the process, right? Now, the process, what am I talking about? Well, we read this list a while ago, and he said, add to your faith, virtue, and so on and so forth. And I'm not going to read the whole list again, but let me just say this. There is a process that you'll find. I hope you'll go home and read these verses this week. Because in this, he gives us a process about how to have permanent, real change in our lives. He says, it begins with your faith. Add to your faith. So you've got to trust God. Add virtue to your faith. Then you've got to depend on the Holy Spirit. Virtue comes from the Holy Spirit. It indicates progressive growth and effort. Remember he said, make every effort? So he's saying that your effort is not useless. It's not, you know, there was something back in the Middle Ages. Um, I, I find this quite funny. Uh, there was a movement in the church called quietism or quietism. You say, what is that? Well, there's this group of people that believe that uh, anything that God wanted them to do, he was going to automatically do it for them. And all they had to do was sit back. In fact, it got so bad, there was a group of them that said, um, if God wants me to eat, he's going to bring the food right to my mouth without me putting in any effort. Let me just tell you, I never would have joined that cult, all right? Because <laughs> if I did, I'd be like, oh, look how God is working, oh, you know. But there was a group of people that believed that anything that happened that God was going to do it for you. Now, God does it with you and through you, but guess what you've got to do? You've got to put forth your own effort. Sometimes, now, I want you to hear me. Sometimes it takes effort to go to church. Sometimes. Sometimes you get excited about it. Then there are other times, like a guy that I know, that he woke up and he started crying. His wife said, what's wrong? He said, I've got to go to church today. And his wife said, I know you're the pastor. All right, so get up. <laughs> Sometimes. But here's the point. Do you know that it's really easy to buy the lie and say that, well, I don't need to go? I don't need to go today. And that turns into, I don't need to go this week. And I don't need to go, and then suddenly it's turned into years. Okay? And so uh, God gives us this process. He said, you've got to make the effort. And guess what? It's progressive. And that's the thing that I love about our relationship with God. It is kind of like our relationship with our children or our grandkids. I watched a little one a while ago walking around. He was walking like he owned the place. I love that. It was cute. And you know what we don't do? Because, you know, when they start talking at that age, you don't jump down their throat and say, we don't say ain't, we say it isn't, all right? You know, I mean, you don't jump on them. Why? Because they're kids. They're babies. You don't mock them. Well, look at Mr. Waddle, how you walk. Oh, can't you walk like an adult? No, he's two, all right? And you know what we love? We love the progress, we love the progress. We, we love to watch them learn. We love it when they start saying words, even though they don't get them right sometimes. It's so cute. Our oldest daughter, when she was little, she loved cheerwo-woes, is how she said it. Cheerios. She loved Cheerios. She said, I want some cheerwo-woes. <laughs> so when she said that, I took her in the bedroom and I spanked her. All right? So I'm kidding. Y'all looking at me like something like, Are you a monster? Of course I didn't do that. You know why? Because she was a baby. And you know what she does now? She doesn't say that. She can say Cheerios. And you know what she showed in that? She showed progress. She showed growth. Now, if you have no progress or no growth, then you got a problem. There's, you're sick. Something's wrong. Okay. So my point is that progress is important. Well, let me go on. He says we need to get to know Jesus, that we've got to exercise self-control, that we've got to be steadfast. That just simply means endurance. You've got to keep on. You've got to be determined. I'm going to go today. 
I'm going to serve today. It's kind of like working out. Until you get some grit and determination, you're not going to do it very long. You know why? Because it hurts. It's inconvenient. You got to get up earlier or stay after work longer. And the point is that it takes effort and endurance. And then he says you've got to add godliness. That's just simply reverence toward God, which means worship. And then you've got to add brotherly affection and love. How do you do that? Being kind? Yeah, well, that's part of it. But you know one of the greatest ways to express Christian love is through serving others. You know that? I mean, anybody can say nice things. Anybody, James said it this way in the book of James, half-brother of Jesus. Here's what he said. He said, uh, you know, if you see a person that's in need and you say, come on in, brother, be warmed and fed, but you don't do anything, he basically said, you're a hypocrite. Now think about that. We can look at others and say, oh, be blessed. You can tell people in the checkout line at the grocery store, if you can find one that actually has cashiers that check you out now instead of doing it yourself. I'm of the opinion that before long, I'll have to start stocking the shelves myself before I get the groceries. <laughs> but you ever notice that some people say this, and I'm not against this, I, I like it. You check out and they say, be blessed, have a blessed day. Well, that's nice, but you know what that does for me? Nothing. I mean, I'm, it's nice, okay, but guess what? If I have a need... If someone says to me, be blessed, and I have no food, well, what does that do? If someone says to me, be blessed, but I'm in dire need, what good does that do? Do you see the point, the practical side of it? He's saying that we reverence God, we love one another. And then he said, the Spirit gives us the person for change. That is the Spirit of God. He said, for if these things reside in you and abound, they ensure that you will neither be useless nor unfruitful. And then the Spirit gives you the provision to change. Now, I know this probably feels like a long list that you probably won't keep, okay, if you're like most people. But it boils down to one thing. So I'm going to boil this whole message down to one thing. And everybody in here can do this. You can do it starting today. You can do it in the morning when you wake up. You can do it every day when you get to work. In fact, you probably will need to say this when you get to work. When I reveal it to you, you're going to get it. Uh, You're going to need it when you come home and you and your wife start to argue. You're going to need it when your kids ask you to help you do math. And you remember the old traditional way to do math. And they have this new thing in schools now that you're like, what is wrong with these idiots? And then you're going to have to repent for saying the word idiot in front of the kid. But it boils down to one step. This whole list. Everything he's talking about. God, understand this. God does not want you to be confused about living for him. He wants you, it's organic, it grows from you. The spirit of God reveals it to you. But he wants you to get it. He's not trying to hide his will from you. Okay? I want you to get it. This is one thing. He gives us the provision to change. What is it? It's this one thing. It will change your habits. It will change your temper. It will change how you respond to temptation. It will change how you respond at church. It will respond, it will change how you respond to people that you disagree with. It's going to help you. And here it is. If it's on the screen, these are the words. Holy Spirit Help me. That's what all this is about. Holy Spirit, help me. Something that comes across my computer screen and I shouldn't be looking at it. And what do I say? Well, I'm just going to look for a little bit. You know, one look ain't going to hurt. No, what do I say? Holy Spirit, help me. Uh, You are at home. You have worked all day. Your husband gets home and he's like, you know, he's expecting certain things. And what do you say? Holy Spirit, help me, okay? 
Your boss comes in and he's breathing down your neck and half the people on your team don't work very well, but he's laying it all on you. And what do you say? Holy Spirit, help me. Your kids are challenging you again. Their room looks like that a troll moved in there and set up residence. And you are tempted once again to lose your temper. Actually, that's a bad example. God will give you a pass for that one, okay? So, um, no. What, what do you say? Holy Spirit, help me. And, and that's the thing. The same power that the resurrected Jesus had, the same power that raised him from the dead, the same power that created the universe is available to you. And what do I say? I say, Holy Spirit, help me. And if you can learn that one thing, then you can, you can grow and you can get better and you can make change. You must depend on the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us today. Help us to depend on you. Help us to love you and to know you. Help us to get to know you better. Not just facts about you, but actually know who you are. And God, I pray that you just bless us today and help each of us to begin to pray this prayer regularly. When we get discouraged, Holy Spirit, help me. When we face temptation, Holy Spirit, help me. When we are afraid, Holy Spirit, help me. When we're depressed, Holy Spirit, help me. Whatever it is, whatever we face, help us to pray that prayer, to depend on you, and to ask you to do what you already want to do, to do what you want to do more than we can even imagine. You're that spirit. You're that helper. You're the one that recalls things to our memory. You're the one that grows us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let me just say this today. If you are watching online, or if you're new in the room, or maybe you're not new in the room, but you know through the Word of God, not just through any magic words that I've said, but you know through the Word of God that the Holy Spirit is dealing with you about your salvation. You know what I believe? I believe there are a lot of people that go to church, some, they don't really have a relationship with Jesus. Oh, they've got a reputation, but I'm not sure that they're a Christian. And so today, maybe you're in that boat, or maybe you're like, no, I know I'm not. I just encourage you to say that same prayer. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit, save me. Did you know you could say a prayer that simple and Jesus will come into your life? He said, how do you know? Peter did it. We've got it recorded in Scripture. I guess the shortest prayer in the Bible, and yet one of the most effective prayers in the Bible. Remember when Peter was walking on water, Jesus told him to come to him, then he starts in the waves and the wind, and he began to sink. You know what he prayed? Our most precious and heavenly, gracious, benevolent, heavenly Father. No, he didn't do that. He didn't act like he spoke King James English. He didn't act like that, you know, he was some pious, you know, deacon at a church that believed that you had to be fancy with your words. I was in a church one time, worked at a church, and uh, they would always have deacons come up to pray over the offering. And this one guy came up, and they always was having to use fancy words. This one guy came up, and he forgot what he was praying for. He's praying for the offering. And he started saying the blessing over the food. He says, oh, Father, thank you for this food. He goes, I mean, this spiritual food that we're about to get. And I'm like, good save, buddy, good save. No, you know what Peter prayed? Lord, save me. Short, sweet, to the point, but it worked. And so my prayer for you is that you'll pray that prayer. Lord, save me. 